Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. As the year 2023 prepares for its farewell, the Middle East is still burdened by one full-scale war, several smaller confrontations, and the ever-present risk of regional conflagration. Israel against Hamas, Hezbollah itching for a fight, but not an existential one, the threat to Red Sea shipping, and, of course, the common Iranian denominator. How are world and regional powers handling these geostrategic intricacies? In the second of two conversations on this topic, with focus today particularly on the European angle, including relations between Europe and Israel, let's now turn to the Kingdom of the Netherlands, where we're joined by Professor Uri Rosenthal, who is the former Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. Thank you for joining us, sir. Good to be with you. Okay. It's good to have you. Uh, also joining me here in the studio as ever, our TV7 uh, editor-at-large, Mr. Amir Oren. Amir, set a stage for us. You know, Jonathan, uh, what um, I'm sure will be most interesting to hear from uh, Professor Rosenthal is the interplay between powers and personalities. Uh, for instance, um, how uh, much is Europe influenced by recent elections uh, in Poland um, and uh, coming ones uh, in Turkey and elsewhere. Um, how is the uh, uh, second anniversary of the Ukraine war uh, going to impact both uh, the world at large and the Israeli war in Gaza? Uh, are we now the center stage or are we still secondary? <clears throat> to the uh, Russia-Ukraine war. And um, what is the worth now of multilateral relations? For instance, Israel vis-a-vis -vis the various European institutions, when we know that policy is set um, by each government and therefore only bilateral relations matter. Indeed. Well, Professor Rosenthal, I'd, I'd like to refer to the first question. Uh, related to this, and that is at a time when everything, as we know, is interconnected in one way or another, how does the war in Eastern Europe reflect to the Middle East and to the relations between Israel and EU member states? Uh, you're, you're actually asking the number one question uh, with regard to the European stance on the several theaters in the world. and. Let me say I, I can be as concrete as as it can be because I saw the uh, calendar for the European Unit uh, Union uh, summit of the government leaders at the in the end of this week, and there it's not just a coincidence that on the agenda is number one uh, Ukraine, number two. European enlargement, EU enlargement, and number three is uh, Israel-Gaza. And uh, let me say uh, emphatically that at this moment, as far as I can see it and feel it also, um, in Europe, the uh, concern about the situation in Ukraine, in the, Russia, in the war between Ukraine and Russia, there are serious, serious concerns about it. And uh, this is actually twofold. It. One is uh, the financial aid to um, Ukraine. Secondly, the pressure from Zelensky and his uh, people to have to make a further step to membership of the EU. And let me say that uh, in that respect, it's definitely so that the worries in the EU are first and foremost with Ukraine and then immediately, of course, also Israel and uh, the war in Gaza. And um, uh, to uh, add one point, uh, the Foreign Affairs Council in the beginning of this week which is actually the preparatory ground for the summit of the government leaders, had two points on the agenda uh, with regard to Israel and Gaza. One was uh, on um, uh, getting into the sphere of sanctions against Hamas 
which is for me a very strange story because Hamas is a terrorist organization, so why also to sanction them then? But it is also sanctions against the supporters of Hamas, which is quite interesting. And secondly, of course, in the, in the well-known uh, tradition of the EU, it has to be uh, even-handed. So at the same time, the high representative, Mr. Borrell, uh, pleads for, a, or for sanctions on those settlers who are uh, resorting to extreme violence. Now, both of these, uh, of these uh, items have not been brought into final conclusions of the Foreign Affairs Council. So I would be doubtful if uh, the summit in the end of the week will actually decide on both of these points. Indeed. Thank you, Professor Rosenthal. I think, uh, and, I, and I've seen this statement by uh, High Representative Borrell, who also condemned Israel for construction in Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley, and, and or at least for its approval of construction starts for those territories, uh, and uh, uh, voiced his condemnation of this and announced, indeed, as you mentioned, uh, his intention to bring in front of the council uh, the suggestion uh, to... Uh, sanction uh, the the uh, radical settlers who are indeed committing uh, heinous crimes by uh, targeting innocent civilians uh, in uh, those territories uh, in breach also of activities by the Israeli government to try and, and stop them, uh, albeit uh, not doing enough to do so, unfortunately, and therefore uh, much more needs to be done. Uh, but with that being said, uh, whatever uh, Representative Borrell, Mr. Oren, uh, usually suggests is usually also not adopted. It seems like his foreign policy or perspe uh, perspective to the foreign policy of the European Union and the actual agenda of the European Commission and Council, for that matter, are two separate agendas uh, whole uh, completely. But when we're looking at the Israeli prism in Jerusalem, they hear those words and it seems like they're brushing them off. Uh, which is uh, why I uh, uh, wanted to deflect uh, this issue to uh, Professor Rosenthal and ask, uh, we have been through uh, Solana and Moratinos and Lady Ashton and Mogherini and now Borrell. How important is the personality and the country of origin of all of these uh, high representatives for foreign and defense policy of the Union? Well, you, you are mentioning this series of high representatives. And uh, uh, let me say that um, uh, Mr. Solana was from Spain, but he, is quite a, he was quite a different character from his um, compatriot uh, Joseph Borrell, I would say. I couldn't imagine a more... Uh, more difference between these two uh, personalities. And let me say uh, quite frankly with you that I don't have the impression, I have no impression at all that Mr. Borrell is of the same caliber as Mr. Solana was. And uh, for that matter, I would say that the role of Mr. Borrell is quite... Uh, is, is not very much appreciated by a couple of uh, ministers of foreign affairs and government leaders in, in, uh, in the EU. To, to give you one example, um, it is actually Joseph Borrell himself who is com continuously trying to, well, he's actually seven days a week for 24 hours per day, he is busy with uh, getting to a deal with Iran on the nuclear um, ambitions of that country. And he puts everything else into that perspective. And, and uh, this, for instance, means that when many member states are by now getting used to the idea that rather sooner than later, the uh, Iranian Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps should be uh, declared a terrorist organization. It is Mr. Borrell who is uh, doing his utmost to avoid that uh, kind of uh, approach. So, and, and 
let me let me add to it. Uh, when we, when you were actually Amir talking about the several countries in the EU in in Europe, uh, it's quite interesting that when it is about sanctions against Hamas and its supporters, this is being proposed by very interesting France, Germany. Well, there you have the power holders in the EU and Italy, by the way, and the. Uh, uh, the sanctions on settlers are proposed by Spain, there we go again, Ireland, usual suspect, Belgium, interesting by itself, interesting by itself, and Malta, which we can uh, put aside in a way. So the leverage is with France, Germany, which is quite an interesting move which is also a little bit surprising that it happens right now, because as you know, for instance, France as a permanent member of the Security Council in the United Nations has supported the uh, anti-Israel resolution uh, last week. Mm -hmm. Why uh, uh, is it such a problem for Ukraine to join the EU rather than NATO, which of course uh, Putin cannot stand, uh, this uh, would uh, uh, immediately evoke uh, Chapter 5. But the EU uh, seems uh, a much more innocent uh, grouping, uh, which Putin uh, can absorb. There are two answers to be given, actually. First, uh, there is quite some, uh, uh, some concern on the European end on the situation in Ukraine itself, where Mr. Zelensky is being... Uh, pushed by uh, both the uh, mayor of Kiev and the uh, leaders and the uh, command and the uh, chief commander of the uh, armed forces. And so there is also disappointment, I would say. I, I, I have to be blunt about it, but there is, of course, a disappointment in Europe, as probably in the United States, about the fact that the spring offensive of Ukraine has not given that much of a success and that is uh, you uh, that is uh, uh, still a soft kind of um, uh, remark on my on my uh, part and then the second point is that when it is about membership for the for Ukraine let me say the in a way the the honeymoon is the honeymoon honeymoon is in a way over and uh, Ukraine is one, but there are there is also on the agenda of the uh, EU um, summit uh, in the end of the week the enlargement with all kinds of other countries, especially from the from the southeast uh, in the Balkan, and uh, so they don't want to see that much of a preferential treatment right now for Ukraine. I would say that is more or less the picture. Indeed. Well, uh, with regard to Ukraine, even though our focus uh, shouldn't be necessarily this uh, topic today, uh, I, I'm highly doubtful uh, that it will become a member, a full member of the European Union, considering that, as you noted, uh, diplomatically, uh, I may aid, add, but uh, there are plenty of countries throughout the European Union who are ardently objecting to uh, this notion, okay. uh, which uh, uh, may sure. indeed bring about uh, this uh, uh, dream to an end quite abruptly. But uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, Mr. Oren, and then uh, add this to uh, Professor Rosenthal, when, when we're looking at uh, the various complexities uh, that we're mapping out, why is Europe important to Israel? <clears throat> First of all, it is uh, almost adjacent to Israel. Um, if you look at uh, the uh, geography, Israel uh, borders or is even a part of the Levant. The Levant uh, ends uh, with Turkey and there you are. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it was not uh, because of any wish of Israel. Israel did want to be integrated into this region but it was forced into the Eurovision Song Contest, uh, into uh, <laughs> European soccer, uh, uh, which at least was, maybe is no longer above its grades. 
Um, and uh, there were dreams, uh, especially during the uh, beginning of the Oslo process, of Israel being considered part and parcel of the Middle East, even Shimon Peres suggested being uh, accepted by the Arab League as uh, its 23rd uh, member. So uh, where else can we look? Uh, we uh, were not accepted as another state in the United States, too far away. Uh, we are farther away than Alaska and Hawaii. Um, maybe even a territory such as Puerto Rico would be enough for us, but this was not uh, offered. So all we have is a sort of an island status, just like Malta, which Professor Rontal mentioned, or Cyprus. Um, and of course, uh, energy and economy are two areas where Europe uh, is still very important uh, to Israel. But because Prior to Brexit, it was roughly almost two-thirds of the Israeli economy rooted in Europe. Yes, indeed. Uh, but, but, you know, Asia uh, has also become a very important uh, market uh, uh, for Israel. And this ties in with the other topic that you raised of maritime shipping uh, via the Red Sea uh, and the uh, Suez Canal, uh, either to Elat or to Ashdod and Haifa. So, yes, uh, we haven't given up on Europe yet, despite uh, all of the disappointments. Indeed. Well, uh, Professor Rosenthal, I'd, I'd like to continue from this point and, and ask you particularly, since uh, Europe has been a disappointment from an Israeli perspective time and again, uh, much has been done, uh, particularly with the, the Netherlands, with Britain, with Germany, natural partners of Israel in Israeli eyes in the past. France was also part of that. Unfortunately, it's now closer to the bottom of the list uh, than the top of the list in friendly nations. But when we really look at the, the continental Europe, how can Europe contribute more to Israel and the Middle East at large at a time when it is acting as a secondary role within uh, the, the various complexities of strategic power competition, being within the camp, of course, of the United States, but at the same time also maintaining a very unique relationship, particularly with China and other Eastern nations that also have keen interest throughout this region, particularly also in energy. And of course, since uh, the, the withdrawal from uh, reliance on Russian oil, uh, the LNG today is being predominantly exported uh, from uh, the United States and Qatar, uh, which has increased its own uh, gross domestic product uh, to uh, by 60% this past year, which provides a lot of insight into the various dealings with Europe in particular. Well, this your question is, um, uh, is actually... Um, picking up the, the truly global dimension, but let me, uh, allow me to, uh, to pick up one point, which is for me, number one, full stop. And that is that when we talk about the European relations uh, to uh, Israel, uh, we should start by looking at the way in which uh, Europe is, uh, or, European member states, at least, are a are loyal allies in the Western alliance. And then I talk, of course, about the position of the European countries in, for instance, NATO, the defense expenditures on the part of the European countries. Um, uh, my country, for instance, uh, trying now its utmost to um, meet the criteria of 2% of its uh, national product uh, for defense expenditures. Um, and so, first and foremost, I would say it is, a, it is about the question whether the European countries, also after the wake-up call of the Russian invasion in uh, Ukraine, will be willing to come up with an with a durable uh, search of it of their defense expenditures, and that is of course indirectly of great importance to uh, to um, Israel, because 
it's no secret that uh, in the United States, right now even, um, there are some who are saying that at a certain moment, um, the um, uh, United States government administration should be a little bit more careful about uh, supplying weapons and what have you to um, uh, several countries. Ukraine is now indeed being uh, in a very difficult position. Israel, not as yet, but you never know. So that is my, my answer to this um, uh, part of your question. And the second point, when you take the whole problem now ra rising in the uh, Red Sea, uh, Bab el Mandeb, etc., I still have the impression that the, in any case in Europe, uh, there is not a resolute awareness of what is going on. Of course, it is there with regard to with uh, the corporate sector, which is uh, very, very uh, anxious about what is happening there. But whether the governments of the Europe in the European Union are really under are really feeling the need to be, to stand firm, and also in that respect, to support Israel um, in the way they should. I'm doubtful about it. There should be something, actually, what is happening, ships are, are there, the Houthis are sending rockets, uh, the ships are being weaponized now, they, they uh, have high insurance rates now, uh, but uh, it is still a matter of the corp of the of the corporations of the um, of the um, uh, ship companies, and I don't I has I'm hesitant about the question whether also the governments are indeed understanding what is going on. Very interesting indeed, uh, Mr. Oren. You wanted to ask something. Yeah, uh, you know, um, uh, both of you, that uh, ever since the 1960s and especially since the Cold War uh, was over, the notion of national service, of mandatory uh, military service, uh, at least for training and then perhaps going uh, into the reserves in order uh, to be ready if there is a call-up, this has gone out of fashion. Um, in most of the Western world, Israel is one of uh, the last democracies to have such a national service because Israel is in a constant uh, need for uh, fighting uh, young men and women. Similar to Finland, if I may add. That's true. And um, I was wondering um, whether the notion of uh, either United Nations or multinational peace forces peacekeeping, um, observers, disengagement and observers as in the Golan Heights, UNIFIL in Lebanon. It started with UNEF, the emergency for in the Sinai, right after the Suez uh, Sinai campaign. Whether the fact that these are really career officers and NCOs, in a way you may call them mercenaries, um, and not draftees, so public opinion should not be against it to that extent. Uh, do you see, um, following the uh, war in Gaza, both the reconstruction being funded by uh, donors in Europe and, if need be, battalions or at least companies made up of uh, the uh, European uh, military forces, uh, at least for an interim period? Well, I would I would actually uh, push the question back to you because I would be surprised if, for instance, Israel, the government of Israel, would have uh, confidence in um, um, in European straightforward aid, military personnel being sent to. Uh, peacekeeping or peace enforcing to um, the um, uh, uh, Middle East. I'm, I'm rather doubtful about it. And, and I, I can, uh, I remember you in these two minutes of, for instance, the UNIFIL 
and the Dutch battalions which were there in the Lebanon, it has not been that much of a uh, success. And so I send the question back to you. And uh, I would love to hear that Israel would really appreciate, genuinely appreciate efforts on the part of the Europeans. It's a difficult, it is a different story when we talk about Europeans uh, helping out on US-led kinds of uh, endeavors. I dimly remember something called BAM, which uh, was composed of uh, Italian carabinieri at the Rafa crossing. <laughs> But this was only uh, as a fig leap uh, when both sides, Israel and the Palestinian Authority, needed it, not really to enforce any uh, law and order. I actually don't think that it has to do with Israel taking this seriously. It has to do with the fact that I don't think the local uh, residents or terror operatives take it seriously. We take uh, Hezbollah as an example, just shooting yesterday uh, a rocket merely 10 meters away from a Unifil yeah. uh, base uh, and uh, putting yeah. the international forces in harm's way. But, Obviously, but, uh, this but, is uh, not something. Allow me, allow me one, one final remark on my part. I hope that uh, uh, Israel also takes it seriously when we talk about uh, the European-Israeli um, relations. So long as uh, Europe will be able to save its face from uh, the dramatic shifts that are current currently uh, throughout the continent. But this is all the time, though, for today. I'd like to thank Professor Rosenthal and Mr. Oren for taking out of your times to update us on the latest and to thank all of you at home as well. Until our next update from here in Jerusalem. Shalom. Shalom.